One, two, three. Ah. Hello. We'll use this one. All right. I'm your host today. Um, so apologies for the late start. Let's dive right in. Uh, where we left off last time was kind of the payoff moment in uh, D3 where you say, it's cool, we're going to be able to take data in the form of arrays uh, of objects in JavaScript. We're going to be able to take elements of the DOM, which although it's a tree-shaped data structure, we can use selectors to pull out sets of it or subsets of it. And then we're going to take that set of data and that set of DOM elements, and we're going to join them together, literally, um, in order to associate data to the DOM and use the data to drive the styling of the DOM. All right, so we're going to be able to write JavaScript then. Having a value associated with an element of the DOM, we can then manipulate that element of the DOM in an interesting way dependent on the data. Typically what we'll do then is we'll change the color or the size or the representation in some way of the visual aspect of the DOM. And so this was kind of the first example of this that we looked at last time was this data-driven text scaling where we had a data set of seven elements and then watch the syntax, d3.select. Remember, select selects the first match and we look for the body of the HTML, which there's typically only one of. Okay, and then through method chaining, that gives us a set of objects, which is a set of size one. It's the DOM subtree with the body. And then we say select all on that to get the paragraphs out of it. And now we've got a set of paragraphs set of P elements, and then we do a dot data to join it to a data set. So uh, we're going to now have an association between these seven elements in the data set and P's in our DOM. And then for each one of those P's that gets passed out, we can apply a style uh, uh, modifier. And we're going to get into the, the HTML style attribute, the CSS style attribute of this thing, and change the font size to the result of a function on the data. So this is an uh, anonymous function. It doesn't have a name, but it takes a data item and it returns the name of that data item with the string px at the end of it. So it'll be 10px, 12px, 14px, etc. And in the font size syntax of HTML, that says how big to render the font. So we've just dynamically created HTML as a join of data and DOM elements. And then, oh, by the way, let's also, you know, through method chaining, we get back that set of... Uh, uh, DOM elements again, and we can change some other style things as constants. And of course, we looked at this in our examples, and uh, that exact text generates, um, you know, this. Actually, we looked at the method chaining version, so it generates this, but it looks the same. Okay. Uh, sorry, that's just making it colored. Here's the data-driven version. And now we're getting the size uh, attribute applied to each of them. That's what we should have seen. That is the code. Uh, the code for this, uh, this uh, page is the code I was just describing. All right, and rather than show that to you in a tiny little window, we'll just show it to you in the PowerPoint. Okay, again, there's the join. Uh, there's the anonymous function, and that's what had happened there. The reason this worked, though, and this is why we opened this up in the editor last time, and I will open it up again. The reason this worked was that we had seven elements in the data set, and we had seven paragraphs in our document, and so they scaled and joined perfectly. But remember that sometimes you will have no elements on the page yet, because the page hasn't even come into being, really. Uh, and in that case, you have data that's, that's in search of DOM elements that don't exist. Or you may have DOM elements and then less data, so you may have DOM elements in search of data that doesn't exist. And D3 provides us with outer join syntax to deal with those two cases. So to remind you, um, we're going to have a method called, well, what we saw in the code just a minute ago didn't say anything about what to do with the data. It said apply the data function, which is really just inner join, if you will. All right? It's just a basic join, and the default is join on position. So the first element in the data set is joined with the first element in the DOM selector. Um, and so the, the inner join of those two things by position is what you get out of data. But you also get handles to get the, out, the left outer and right outer join tuples. Right? So if we think about a full outer join, I'll draw a picture I put on the board last time, Here's the attributes of the data, which because they're JSON objects, there may be many attributes here, right? They could have many keys, which have different values. And here's the uh, attributes of the DOM, which also can have many attributes, because DOM elements can have tags in them, which could be attributes. Um, so some of this stuff just joins up, because there's so many DOM elements and so many data elements, okay? And in this case, this is what you get out of the data call, is the actual join. Now in some cases, there's more data than DOM, and when that's true, go 
suppose this is where the DOM starts, okay? When that's true, this is in what's called data.enter. And that gives you the data left outer join tuples that aren't in the inner join. If it's the other way around, if there's DOM elements but no data, that's what's called exit. All right, so those are matches on the right side of the right outer join that didn't match with data. And you've access to both of those and then you can do things with them. All right, and so that's what this slide is saying. Matches get updated directly as in the code we just saw. They get passed along down the method chain. Um, and actually, if you go look in the web inspector, the, the way the join works, actually, deep down inside, is that the data element gets copied into the HTML. It gets copied into the DOM as an attribute of, of name underscore underscore data underscore underscore. So what D3 really does is it takes that data item and it just copies it into the DOM element with that key. All right, it's kind of a hack if you think about it. Like maybe you already had something called underscore underscore data underscore underscore in which case I don't actually know what happens. Um, but you know, it's the beauty of D3 is they decided to meet the web with the syntax the web has, and that's HTML and CSS. So uh, this is the way they actually, uh, this is where they put the join outputs. They hang them in the DOM tree as text. <coughs> Left results are in the enter set in JavaScript, right results are in the exit set in JavaScript. And then by styling an enter and exit, you get to define the page dynamics, and that's where the fun comes. So as we saw last time, the standard pattern for enter is select all data, enter, append. And this is where we ran out of battery or whatever it was last time, right? So here's a typical snippet of D3. D3.select, go get some stuff, maybe select all underneath it. So a body and all the P's underneath it. But you get a selection of DOM stuff. You join it to some data with the dot .data command uh, uh, method. And then you call dot .enter. And what that actually returns is not method change in the sense that it doesn't return the things that was passed in. It returns something different. What was passed in was the DOM all the, all the things that match the selector. What is passed back out from enter is just the things that didn't match, just the data items that didn't match the DOM. So the dot enter actually gives you back data, right? And the author of D3, Mike Bostock, likes to write his code by having the dot enter outdented a little bit to remind you in your method chain that suddenly the stuff that's being passed down the chain changed, okay? So now at the end of dot .enter, we've got the array of data that didn't have a DOM match, and then you can do stuff with it. And in particular, what the standard pattern is, you generate things, you append to the DOM things of the sort that you were looking for in the first place. So if you're looking for P's, now we append P's for all the new stuff. And what this makes sure is that every data item has a match in the DOM. We generate matches in the DOM for the things that didn't start to find a match. Okay. So here's a typical example um, based on what we did before. Um, in addition to the code we had before, we'll say paragraphs is defined as select the body, select all the P's, join with the data set, call that paragraphs. The enter of paragraphs, what we're gonna do is append a new paragraph for the things that didn't match. We're going to add a text attribute to that paragraph because paragraph without text is not very interesting. And what is that paragraph text attribute going to say? It's going to say line space i plus 1. What's i plus 1? Well, in, in D3 anonymous functions, the first argument is the data item. The second argument is a counter of how far down in the data item list we went. It's an index into that list. So this is going to, if you're the ninth thing in the data set that didn't find a match, this will say line 9. Okay? And then we're going to style it the way we styled it before by using the contents of that line, of that data to color it. So let's see what that looks like. It's pretty obvious. We have seven items, I believe. Oop. So this is gonna, we're gonna have to actually modify our, our DOM page to play with this. So let's just go ahead and do that. Um, funny enough, that's not what I wanna look at. So, great. Here's the dot enter. So this case dot enter, we started out with eight paragraphs and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven items. Let's take away a bunch of these. Let's just have one paragraph in this document now. Okay, so this is a new web page, it's only got one page, but we've got our dot enter and append stuff that we just looked at on the screen right here so that when we render this page, we get seven lines after all. Oh, refresh. There we go, we get seven lines after all. Right, because we had seven data items. So we actually synthesized the text, line two, line three, line four, line five, that got synthesized by the D3. And just to make sure we believe that, 
let's change that anonymous function on the append to not call it line, but to call it uh, new magic line. Just to we can believe that this is really, ah, what did I just do? I just deleted what I typed. There we go, new magic line. And uh, as you'd expect, okay? And if the page had happened to have more paragraphs in it, then we would get fewer magic lines. So just a sec. Unfortunately, all these lines are called line one, but that's perfectly legal, right? So there's six things that say line one, and then there's one extra data item, which generated new magic line seven, all right? What about if we have too many lines? So now it's seven for seven, and that's the example we saw before, and that's all good. But now our data set has seven items, and we've got eight, nine, ten DOM elements. What's going to happen now is we're going to get some crazy stuff out there. I decided to make it say null. And this is the exit case. Okay, so let's look at it in the PowerPoint quickly. The standard pattern for exit would be for the DOM elements that don't have a match, just remove them. So we can go do that in our code and see what it looks like. For the exit call here, by the way, all this code's in GitHub, you know that, right? It's in the class repo under viz examples. So what we could do for the exit is we could say dot remove. All right, and then what'll happen to this page, as you would expect, is that although there are a whole bunch more paragraphs, we're only getting seven lines drawn, right? Remember that we had something like 10 actual lines. But what I chose to do instead of dot remove, you can do whatever you want. So what I decided is that if there's P's for which there's no data, we'll just write the word null and we'll make it italic and blue. And so you can do that too. So there's nothing that says that the exit clause actually has to make things leave the visualization. That's just what's frequently what happens is when you run out of data, you have no more data to visualize. So you throw away the pictures that you used to associate with that data. But you don't need to throw them away. You could leave traces of it. You could do whatever you want. All right, so that's uh, enter and exit. That's the outer join at the heart of D3. So that's what we did in the code. Uh, a common thing to do in exit actually is a little bit of a mixture of what I did and what uh, remove did, which is you do a transition uh, 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 command which animates the exit of the data. So I didn't actually type this one up, but there's a method in D3 called transition which actually you use in your homework. Um, I think it's in there for you, actually. Maybe. No, maybe you're forced to figure this out yourself. Transition is basically a way to get animations in D3, and it, it interpolates between where you start and where you end. So, for instance, if you have a point, it's center started here, and you want to change it center to there, you can call transition, and it'll move smoothly from here to there. Um, so, oftentimes, on exit, before the thing disappears, you do a transition, like you have its color transition from its current color to the background color, so it disappears over a little period of time, right? So you watch it disappear. So that's often a thing you want to do on the exit. All right, so all this was not very much like data visualization. This just looked like web page manipulation, right? Font size tuning, which is a little weird. But because HTML uh, is the language of everything you see in your browser, you can have um, graphical shapes in HTML. So this is a D3 bar chart, all right? And we'll see in a sec. It's made entirely out of HTML divs. What is a div? It's, a, it's just a rectangular piece of the, the web page. Right, and it's it's rendered, uh, uh, you know, as a little rectangle. Now, I think initially the idea is that rectangle would hold text, but you could just have it hold a color, and then it looks like a bar in a bar chart, or it looks like a rectangle anyway. Um, and so here, what we're going to do is we're going to find the existing divs in the body, join them with data. For those things that don't have a match, we'll generate a new div. Right? We'll style it um, blue with a certain width and a certain uh, uh, margin on the right-hand side, and then we'll make the height of that rectangle be a function of the data. That's what a bar and a bar chart is. It's, just, it's a thing that's as high as the data tells it to be. Um, let's see what happens. Okay, here's that code. Note, by the way, Oh, no, this isn't interesting. I'm multiplying the value by five just so the bars don't look goofy. Um, and I think that's everything that's going on in this, in this little guy. Let's look at it in our browser. And this is going to look suspiciously like a bar chart. 
Like, we're actually generating data visualizations now, okay? So that's good. And we didn't really do anything with graphics or any calls to any graphics API. This is just coloring HTML divs. So you can certainly do that with D3. All right. However, you may want to do things that aren't rectangular. You may want to do graphical shapes. You may want to throw, you know, pictures of cute manga characters in your charts. I don't know what you want to do with your charts, right? But you may want to have all kinds of more decorative things. They're rectangles. And for that purpose, you can call into SVG, which is this uh, textual language of graphics that has become a standard in browsers. So SVG is just a markup language like HTML, but it's not HTML, it's its own language for shapes. And uh, browsers, modern browsers have compilers that compile it down to stuff that runs actually on the GPU very efficiently. So you can actually do lots of SVG on a page and have it render pretty well. Um, and it looks nice because it's vector graphics, right? So it doesn't, no jaggies and all that stuff. <coughs> and, you know, you can have an SVG element in the DOM, and then within that you have SVG specifications. So the SVG element will have a width and a height, and then you can have SVG things like circles and splines and, and all kinds of graphical kinds of specifications. And you can fill in their attributes like the X position of the center, the Y position of the center, the radius of the circle. They all have these kind of attributes, and you, they're in text just like HTML is, which means that you can manipulate them with D3 just like you manipulate the DOM. Right? So it's just as easy to change your uh, SVG elements as it is to change your DOM elements. So that bar chart now in SVG, the only thing that's going to change is we're going to select up there the SVG element. All right? So we're going to get the first SVG element on the page, and then within that, we're going to manipulate SVG stuff. So we're going to find all the rects which are rectangles in that SVG element, and join that to the data. All right, and then for those things that don't have rects, we will um, append a new rect. And then look at the Y and the X attributes of this rectangle. The Y attribute of the rectangle is going to be a function of the data, right, which is going to be the height, except that in SVG, the height starts at the top of the rectangle. So if you don't do some arithmetic, you get an upside-down bar chart where everything's growing, growing from the ceiling down to the floor. So you have to take the height minus the value of the data. You take the total height of the region, of the region you're drawing your chart, subtract out the data, and that gives you the, the place to start drawing the top of the bar, and then it drops down to the bottom. Okay? So that's just an upside-down bar chart, H minus D times 5H is the height of the, of the SVG element. And then the X position, remember it's a bar chart, right? So we have to have it march left. Every bar's got to be, or march right, sorry. Every bar's got to be one to the right of the previous bar. With divs, we got that for free because HTML was laying out a document for us, right? And the document was in sequential order, so each rectangle was after the next rectangle because that's how text is rendered. With SVG, you're actually saying, where is this rectangle on this canvas of size 500 by 100? And so you have to say that its X position is a function of i, of the second possible argument to a D3, which is its index in the data. So the zeroth element will be on the far left at zero, the first element will be at 22, the second element will be at 44, and so on. Note that the width of these rectangles is 20. So 20 out of that 22 is going to be bar, 2 out of that 22 is going to be space, and these will be spaced out neatly. Okay? And so you do have to do your X's and your Y's here. Um, Oh, and the bar is going to have a height. In addition to its Y position, it has a height. The height should be just enough to get it to the bottom of the chart, right? Because the Y position gave the top of the bar, and the height's got to get it to the, to the X axis at the bottom. All right? And so just to show you what that looks like, here's the SVG version of the bar chart. The scaling didn't come out quite the same, so it doesn't look quite the same as the previous one. That's fine. You could change that. But just to show you, it doesn't look very different right now. But the cool thing is it didn't have to be a bars and a bar chart anymore because it's SVG, right? So it could have been something more pretty. It could have been, for example, circles instead of bars. So we could, instead of plotting this, we could plot circles uh, and we could make the uh, radius of the circle r a function of the data. Uh, and we'll make the x position of the circle just like we did with the bars. The x positions will go from left to right. So this is going to look a little bit more like a data visualization now. Uh, that has some pizzazz, maybe. Oh, I also added some code to get colors out. Okay. So uh, this is starting to look a little more entertaining now and a little less like the database professors building visualizations. Um, but I did want to keep this very simple. So the one thing I added here that's not in the slides is this scale. So look at that code. I have a variable called colors, and it's a D3 scale. It's a category scale. So it's a scale where, uh, what's a scale? A scale is an array of values. Okay, uh, In this case, it's an array of 20 values representing 20 different categories. So if you have like uh, 
models of cars, and you want to apply them, uh, plot them as the x-axis in a chart. It doesn't matter what order they're in, because models of cars don't have a, a natural ordering, like say, uh, I don't know, uh, moments in time have an ordering. Models of cars don't. So it's called a categorical attribute. And these colors, what's uh, interesting about the scale is every one of the 20 values in this array generated by scale.category20 is pretty different than the ones next to it, so that you get differentiation as you look left to right. So when we saw those colors, you could clearly see that each one was a different category, and then their sizes were uh, what you were focusing on. And you could see that two neighbors were different from each other, so you didn't confuse them. Sometimes you want a scale that's uh, smooth, like if you're trying to make the color represent a numerical value of the data. Suppose you have a, a map, and you want every state's color to represent how many people live in that state. Well, then states that have similar populations should have similar colors. States that have very different populations should have very different colors. That scale would be maybe a linear scale. Right, so that the values in that array would go from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, or 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, or something. Actually, though, the way we perceive color, you might want to have it be a logarithmic scale. Um, and so there's a bunch of different scales that you can get out of D3 that will generate these arrays of values, or these really functions that you can look up into for values. Um, and the different scales, you want to choose them appropriately. So there's log scales, there's linear scales, there's categorical scales, uh, and others, right? And you'll be playing with this in your homework to style your visualizations, right? Um, and so this is just one of the extras that I wanted to show you. But again, oftentimes driven by data, you generate data with a scale and you join it to your actual data uh, as part of the DOM. Okay, cool. So that looks a little bit better. <laughs> Last... Uh, before I move on, I mean, I purposely did the world's most low-res, boring visualizations to kind of get you very deeply in touch with what's going on. I find when you look at the visualization tutorials on the web, they want to take you to something fancy really fast, and maybe you don't really get that it's just a join up front, and you don't get that you're just manipulating text. Um, and there's sort of, like I say, there's these long pain descriptions of what outer joins are to, for D3 programmers. I think for us, if you say, look, it's an outer join, and you just very simply modify the text of the DOM, you realize what's possible. And then, of course, you can do all kinds of cool visual effects with that data DOM join. But just to be clear, this is like uh, the D3 homepage, which has just this, which, by the way, is all written in D3, of course. Um, but these are visualizations that have been done in D3 as part of a single D3 visualization. And there's a ton of them, and they're very beautiful, many of them. Um, and they're beautiful for a bunch of reasons. One, because the scales are carefully chosen. Um, and they're chosen based on people's perception of values and how they can distinguish one value from the next um, visually. It has a wonderful mapping library built in that was added by third parties that can do things like all kinds of different projections of maps. You know how you take the sphere of the world and you project it onto a rectangle of paper? So there's different cartographic projections of maps. They have many of them in D3, and you can choose them and play with them. So maps can be very beautiful. Um, and uh, uh, you can deal with things like instead of uh, x, y coordinates, you can have radial coordinates. So you can lay things out as donut charts or, or pie charts or all kinds of other things laid out radially. And they also do graph layout. So you can specify visualizations in D3 where what the data gets mapped to is nodes in a graph. And then they'll do a force layout of the graph so that all the nodes and edges kind of settle into a place where you can see them well. So there's many sort of features under the covers beneath this basics of of selections and joins uh, that can lead to some really sophisticated visualizations. A large fraction of the interactive data visualizations you see on the internet these days are written in D3. It's, it's outrageously, the growth curve of D3 usage is crazy. I, I, you, know, you would love to have a project of your own succeed as well as D3 has succeeded. It's really great. So it's very flexible, very powerful language. So to sum up, the first theme of D3 from a design perspective, and this is something you should learn from if you ever want to design a language, and you want people to adopt it, is you exploit the standards of the community that you're trying to target, which in this case is JavaScript, CSS, and HTML, right? And you make sure to work within those standards. So D3 exploits web standards for display. So everything it's displaying is just manipulation of the DOM and things you can embed in the DOM, like SVG. And it's using web standards for code. It's a, it's a very JavaScript-y library. If you're a JavaScript programmer, it's very natural, okay? So that was the first theme of the, of the library. And the second is um, really most of the conceptual work you're doing in a data visualization is configuring mappings, mappings between data and visual elements. And you do that with you know, database stuff, with selections and with joins. Okay, pretty straightforward. There's a ton more to learn than I had time to teach you. There, 
Mike Bostock, who's one of the three authors of D3 and sort of the leading one these days, uh, keeps a, Wikipedia, uh, a wiki excuse me, on his GitHub with tutorials that other people have written. There's like dozens of them. Uh, one that I really liked is this one from the University of Washington. Um, really, really helpful by a graduate student there. Um, there's another one that's very popular that was an O'Reilly book, which is this alignedleft.com one, um, which is free if you want to read it online. All right, so that's D3. And if you remember from last time, I promised you that we'd look at a different way of thinking about data visualization specification. Uh, and this is going to be what's called a grammar of graphics. And the particular grammar graphics we're going to look at is called vega.js, which comes from the D3 family. So if you decide to use it, it'll have some familiar elements. The original phrase, grammar of graphics, is due to a guy named Wilkinson. He has a book on Amazon you can go pay too much money for. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be online uh, in any other form. Um, there's a library in R, in the R statistical language, called ggplot2. GG stands for grammar of graphics. And um, it is well documented in the public domain by a guy named Hadley Wickham, who uh, wrote it. And um, ggplot2 is very faithful, actually, to Wilkinson's grammar of graphics. And then Tableau, which is probably the most popular commercial data visualization toolkit, um, has its own grammar of graphics language called VizQL under the covers. Most Tableau users never see it. But it is the underlying specification of all the graphs you ever form in Tableau, and it allows them to compile from your visual graphs down to SQL or other data access layers. So th they're very widespread, in short, the use of grammar of graphics. Vega is a library over D3 for doing grammars of graphics in JavaScript. All right? So it uses D3 underneath. Um, the author of Vega is Jeff Hare, who is the faculty advisor on the D3 project, one of the three D3 authors. So Vega is actually getting uh, some adoption now, and not, certainly not as much as D3, but it's on that same community and that same curve. It's a lot simpler than D3. In particular, Vega specifications are not code. They're just descriptive. So you write no JavaScript at all. You write just a JSON object, which is a, like a, Java, a JavaScript data structure to describe your graph. It's totally declarative. And you don't write any JavaScript code at all. So it's, it's simpler to, to, to learn as a result. And because it's not JavaScript code, because it's just a spec, you can actually generate it from other languages. So for example, there's a lang uh, package in Python called Vincent. It's a Python graphing language. Right? It's written in Python. You, you express all the things you want to do in Python. But what it generates is jo Java, it generates a JSON object which is a D3 spec, which you can load into a web page. So although you're a Python programmer, you're generating stuff that loads up in a web page in JavaScript. And so because it's neutral, because it's not code, it's more sort of uh, programming language agnostic, which is kind of nice. So what is a, J a Vega specification? It's a JSON file. If you haven't seen JSON, it's pretty much JavaScript objects. So it's key, pair, it's, uh, sorry, key value pairs, like uh, hash maps, and arrays, and, and, and values. All right. And in that JSON file, you give the basics of your chart, like the height and width of it. You give the actual data in the file as an array. Okay? You can actually also specify the data is in a CSV file over here, or the data is in a website you can go fetch over there. So there's a way to specify remote data. You specify what are this, it's called the scales in Vega. What this means is that, you know, in any chart, you have the x-axis, let's say, and the y-axis, if it's a rectangular chart. And you want to know if this is going from 0 to 100, is it linear, so it's evenly spaced, or is it logarithmic, or is it exponential, et cetera? All right, so the scales define the bounds and the scaling of the axes, which in a two-dimensional xy are going to be the x and y axis. So that's how you actually map data two visual values, right? Because you need to know conceptually if things go from 0 to 100, and I have the value 47, where in x space is 47? Is it 47% across? That would be a linear scale. But in a, in a logarithmic scale, it would be somewhere else, right? So that scale is an abstraction. It maps data values to visual values. The axes are actually graphical objects. They're pictures. They're lines like this or like this. And you can specify the shapes of the axes, which visualize the scales, OK? And then finally, there's the marks, which are the things you want to draw that are associated with the data. And you describe the marks in terms of the data. So you might say that the marks are are circles, right? And that the radius of the circle should come from the data's x value, right? So you just specify these things without writing any code. So this is largely static in the sense that you just write down this spec. You say, I want a chart. I want it to have circles for each, a circle for each data item. I want the circle's x position to be a linear function of the 
value you know, age in that object. I want its y position to be a linear value of its height, say, in that data object. And then just put those circles on the map for me. Oh, and the radius will be something, right? So you specify the attributes of the data and the attributes of the visualization. But that's it, it's static. The thing is, now you've got a Java, uh, JavaScript object, a JSON object. If you want to write JavaScript to manipulate it, you're free to do that, right? You just don't do it in Vega. So the Vega piece is static, but you can, of course, manipulate the Vega spec or the, the, the uh, actual web page using JavaScript. Um, Vega does have some APIs uh, to, to queue some redrawing, which I, I'm not going to talk about here. So I won't uh, go into a great detail. It's worth going through the tutorial online if you really want to see Vega. But what we will do is we'll look at uh, uh, a little example here. So a Vega um, visualization is a single object. Let's just break it up into pieces. Here's a Vega spec. It would be wrapped up in squigglies, okay? It's got a width and a height that determines the, the object that's going to get rendered. Uh, you can put some padding on that width and height to just put some white space around the graph. And then it's got a viewport, which is optional, which might be that the, the logical space of this graph is 400 by 200. But what we're going to render is only 100 by 100 of it. That's a viewport. And then actually it'll automatically give you um, uh, sliders. So you can slide around inside that viewport to the full 400 by 200 within that 100 by 100. Okay, so you can actually have the canvas be bigger than the viewport if you want. And then you get data, which is going to look a little different than we had it in JavaScript. It's going to have a name, which in this case is the word table. And then it's going to have values, and the values field is what we're used to from D3. Okay? And you can load data from the web if you want or from, from files. Vega does support some basic transformation functions like um, filtering lists and folding lists and stuff. I'm not going to get into them. I guess this was an effort on the part of the authors to deal with the fact that they didn't have a programming language. So they kind of tucked in a little bit of kind of Excel-style data transformation into the spec language. But you can just do this outside of Vega, actually, so I'm not sure why it needed to be in Vega. And then we have a spec of the scales. So here's the scales for our little visualization. Um, scales have to have names, all right, because we're going to reference them when we talk about axes. Um, and then they have types. So the type of a scale could be ordinal, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay? It could be um, categorical, like, you know, uh, Honda, Buick, whatever. Those don't have any particular order, right? So categorical scales don't have a, a meaningful order. Ordinal scales not only have a meaningful order, but have every value on them. You can also have numeric scales, okay, which are like a numeric range. Um, so we have the type of the scale. We have its range, which could be, you know, from some x value to some, some minimum value to some maximum value. In this case, it's the width of the entire, uh, I'm not sure where the ranges are coming from here. I apologize. Um, and then the domain of the scale tells you where to go find the scale if it's coming from data. So very often what's going to happen is you have the data set, and you want the scale to go from the lowest value in the data set to the highest value in the data set. And this is telling you where the data set is. It's in, a, it's in your data section. It's in the thing called table, and it's in this particular field, data.x. Given all that, we can find the min and the max from the data. Okay. And then there's the axes. The axes are, as I said, renderings of the scales. So in particular, this is going to be an x-axis, and the scale that it's rendering is the one that we named x before. And the y-axis is a scale that's named y. And you can have attributes of an axis, like takes, and whether it's uh, oriented on the right side of the chart or the left side, and so on. So axes are visualizations of scales. What you're seeing here, I think, with all this, much less flexible than D3. It's like kind of cookbook. It's like, oh, you want a chart? You can have a chart. It's going to have axes. It's going to have marks that are laid out in a point in space. Like, that's what a chart is. So just tell me all that stuff. You don't have all this crazy flexibility to do enters and exits and draw whatever you want, right? So they took away some of the flexibility, but it's very sort of obvious what it's doing. The last part, which is kind of the fun part, is marks. So we are going to want to be able to associate visual objects with the actual data items, and that mapping is what the marks are. So much like D3, it does have a notion of enter and update for marks, and a notion also of hover state. So if you move your mouse over something, things can change. And then properties of the marks. So in this case, the mark is of type rect, so we're drawing rectangles. And it has an x property, because it's a rectangle, and a width. And it has a y property and a y2 property, which generates the bounds of the y. Okay. Um, and it's got things like fill colors and all that kind of stuff. So this is pretty familiar from D3.
Oh, yeah. The last thing you need to do uh, mention here in Vega is that um, because we have a hover function or a hover specification in Vega, you need to have an update specification because really what we're doing, like we did with D3, is we're redoing the join. After you move your hover away, and you'll do this in your homework in D3, by the way, you hover over a point, it changes color because that's what you said in your hover function. We're going to turn it to blue. When you move it away, it's supposed to do whatever it usually does, right? which in D3 would have been whatever happened in the dot data specification. Here, that's the update specification. So update is, that's the thing you do normally to the data, is you apply the update, which in this case is you make it blue. All right, so um, a nice thing about Vega is there's a live editor online where you can go and you can kind of dork around with it. Oh, I'm not on the internet, so you can't see it right now. But you can, li you can go to this GitHub page for Vega and play with live Vega visualizations, tweak them, and see how they tweak the outputs. Um, and they have a pull-down menu of like 25 different, some very fancy, visualization specified in Vega. So it's pretty easy to learn. Here's a screenshot of that, uh, since I don't have it. This is a very famous visualization of Napoleon's march um, and how many troops he had as he went from Paris to wherever Napoleon turned around at Waterloo. Is that, am I remembering my history right? And, sorry, say again? Moscow. Moscow, thank you. And then uh, the troops' uh, sizes as he returned uh, is not good. This is a very famous visualization. It's kind of hard to draw. There's a secondary plot at the bottom that I can't remember what it represents. Um, but anyway, it's a fancy one. And this is the, the spec over on the left, and you can scroll through it online. All right, so to summarize the themes of Vega, much simpler, much less sort of, sort of uh, programmatic than uh, D3, but much more declarative. So it's just a mapping of data. Scales and marks do most of the work. Once I know x space and y space, or on a circle chart, radial space, and I know where the data goes. Then the last bit is it just for each data item, once I know where it goes, what do you want me to draw there? And what are its properties? What's its color? What's its extent? And so on. So very simple. It does have D3 like enter, update, exit, and hover stuff, but it's defined entirely on marks. There's no DOM involved. You're, you're always talking about the marks you're drawing. And then it has typical stuff like axes and other things. It's surprisingly general, though. And in fact, when you compare it to something like the Excel chart wizard, it's way more powerful. So even with just this simple specification language, this grammar of graphics, you can have a pretty expressive, uh, data-centric, declarative uh, visualization language. OK, so before we move on, let me just say that you know, data visualization uh, is a huge topic. Languages for data visualization are themselves a very big topic, and I left out a lot. So there's a lot of visualization-specific issues I totally glossed over. So for example, if you do with geographic data with maps, there's a ton of domain-specific things about maps and how projections work. And um, A common example that we actually see in our homework, a standard map that the United States uh, Cartographic Society or whatever recommends, USGS maybe, is the 48 states and then Alaska and Hawaii over in the lower left, right? That doesn't correspond to any geographical reality, right? Because Alaska is nowhere near Hawaii. But that's how the U.S. is often drawn, and that's often what you want in your visualizations. So like, you get into the world of maps, particularly like try to do historical maps, like do visualizations of maps from the past, and it gets pretty crazy pretty quick. And people who think about map visualizations have tons of fun, but it's super detail-oriented about space and about the way people have represented space uh, on maps. Because it's not necessarily related to physical space. Or not directly, only through functions. Um, <coughs> I glossed over actually a pretty powerful piece of these languages, which is how do you make charts nested inside of charts? So how do you do compositional effects of these things? How do you essentially recurse in these languages? So that you can have, for example, uh, if you're three-dimensional or even you've higher dimensional data, so maybe your x-axis is one field, your y-axis is another, and your color is, is the third, but maybe you have four or five dimensions, then you may draw multiple charts with different settings for the fields that you didn't have in the charts. So you have essentially an array of charts so how do you draw those array of charts? It's a very common thing. So these are things, to do. you can also nest charts within charts and that often gives very natural effects. So uh, I didn't show you how to do that. I didn't show you how to connect to databases and get data out of them. Or even more importantly, and this is something that Tableau, for example, a commercial tool will need to do. You wanna render a chart that is built on a lot of data but then aggregates that data before it renders it. That aggregation should happen in the database engine, not in the web browser or the application. So you actually want to take the chart specification, compile it down to SQL, push the SQL into the database so it's run efficiently there, produces much less data that you then visualize. Okay, so we didn't talk about how that works. And then last, but certainly not least, because I have a startup company that does this, um, 
When you talk to people who build visualizations, they'll tell you that doing visualizations is the fun part of their job, but 80% of their time is like wrangling the data into the shape that the visualization tool expects. So D3 expects things in these nice JavaScript objects. Data doesn't come that way most of the time. So you have to write a bunch of annoying code, kind of like the code you guys wrote for homework one, to get your data from the format it came in to the data that the visualization tool can actually absorb. Maybe it's CSV files or JSON files or whatever. And that's incredibly painful in many cases. Not only to get the structure right, but also to get the data right, because oftentimes the data is wrong too, and you've got to fix it. So um, just be aware that visualization uh, is a function uh, that comes after data prep. Okay, tons of tutorials online, tons of packages that I didn't tell you about. Here's a list of some of them. Um, I gave you some uh, references if you want to learn about other visualization toolkits in the notes. Thematic takeaways, you know, conceptual takeaways. Modern visualization specifications are more and more based in declarative languages, and the themes you learned in this class apply to visualization. So selections and mapping and attributes of marks. Once again, as we saw, bulk function invocation. If you're going to have to call a function on lots of data values, that's join. Right? That's what you did in homework four. You essentially treated batch evaluation of rest calls as a join of the request buffer and the response cache. Right? Um, similar flavor here of the join of the data and the DOM. Right? Um, and the functions, those anonymous functions that called, get called on the data during that join. So this is actually a very common sort of data-driven computing theme. The way you get a lot of compute over a lot of data is to treat this as a join of the data and the function you want to call. Domain-specific languages are really, really useful. So we learned one in this class, it's called SQL. We've now learned another, it's called D3, okay? Um, both of them have flavor of declarative data languages. One of them was for querying, one of them was for drawing, all right? But domain-specific declarative languages are very common and tend to win over time uh, from general purpose languages because uh, they're simple, they're composable, they're high level, they compile down to many targets and so on. This space is changing fast. I would expect in five years that what we'll learn and, and, and work on in this uh, topic will be very different from what we have today. D3 is only four years old, um, but it's all over the web now. Um, and I would expect in five to 10 years there'll be new stuff, okay? So this will change fast. All right, I stole much of this lecture from lots of other places, so it's in the notes. <coughs> Unlike most of the other slides, which I stole from myself and other people who've taught this class. All right. Questions about data visualization before we move on? This is the last we'll talk about it in class, so I'd love to take any questions people have about the how or also the what's going on with data visualization. I would predict that if that many of you will end up doing this kind of stuff somewhere along the way. It's, it's a very common thing to do these days to have to build a data viz, so hopefully this was useful. A little bit less conceptual than some of the other lectures, I know. Okay, well, take a stretch because we're switching to a completely different topic. Okay, okay, okay. So from the sublime to the ridiculous, uh, we were like way up here in data visualization land. Everything was about pretty pictures and it was all like, uh, you know, super high level code. Now we're gonna go way to the bottom of databases, like deep in the guts. How do databases support lots of people accessing the data at the same time? So this is very low level systems implementation stuff. Uh, conceptually very beautiful and rich. Actually, there's a strong theory behind it, but it is uh, the theory of how you build systems. It has very little to do with like people and eyeballs and perception. So we're, we're now in computer systems land. And this is finally delivering on the promise I had at the beginning of this, the semester that we would teach you about how to build an entire database system. Up to now, including the data visualization layer, this was the single user stack, right? It was, okay, we're gonna do everything from storage of bits on the disk all the way up to how it surfaces in your eyeballs. We just finished that journey. 
But along the side, there was another dimension, which is, oh yeah, there's going to be lots of people using this at the same time, and we have to deal with the case that it might fail while it's running, and we need to keep people's data safe. So this cross-cutting concern of concurrency control and recovery from failure is what we're going to do next. And once we get that second dimension, so to speak, put in, then you will really understand the fullness of databases. Okay. So that it, it's not as surprising, I guess, as, as it might be that we're going from the top to the bottom because the reason we were at the top is we completed our single user journey and now we need to do the multi-user version. So transactions were invented um, in the 70s. A lot of the work was done at IBM. The sort of uh, leader of that team was a guy named Jim Gray who was the Berkeley's first PhD in computer science and a Turing Award winner. Um, and a lovely guy who uh, was lost at sea some years ago and never found again, which is a very interesting story you can read about. There's uh, lots of press coverage at the time. Um, and was a, a big booster of Cal. Uh, uh, and so there's uh, undergrad fellowships named after him and his wife because they donated lots to the university. Wonderful guy. Anyway, um, the reason I'm going to say that is because he was also a funny guy, and he was very much a man of his times, which is to say of the 70s. So there's... Uh, you see the pictures of these guys making this stuff up in the 70s. They're all these like long-haired, you know, 20-somethings. Uh, and so um, there's all these like stupid sort of sophomoric jokes about drugs in the literature that they wrote. <laughs> so the key properties of database systems uh, or sort of transactions are the acid properties, okay? Um, and uh, so it's hard not to start the lecture without a quote from the Times. And it's kind of appropriate because acid properties are all about preserving your data, and so it's, it's just kind of funny. Okay. So today we're going to talk about concurrency control and recovery and the notion of transactions. This is an introduction to what's going to be a multi-lecture segment on concurrency control and recovery. So concurrency control, what do I mean by that? I mean the function of a database system that provides correct, and we want a really strong notion of what correctness means, okay? A correct and highly available, meaning that you can actually get access to the system. Correct and highly available data access function, we need to provide that in the present of, presence of concurrent access by many users. All right? It's easy to solve this problem if you don't have, it, have to make it be correct. It's easy to solve this problem if you don't have to be available, like you could just turn the system off. And it's easy to solve this problem if you only have one user. All right? But we want all three of those things at the same time. So this is going to be hard. Secondarily, we want to ensure recovery. So we want the database to be fault tolerant in a particular sense, uh, which is to say that no matter if there's corruption by application level code, or if the hardware itself should fail, we want to be able to recover from those failures. Right? And there's a certain, in any fault tolerance work, there's a certain class of failures you can handle, and we'll talk about exactly the kinds of failures we want to handle when we talk about database recovery. All right. This stuff uh, is important because you want to have kind of 24 by 7 access to this mission critical data, so you want to be able to make sure that when things go down, they come back up. And I'll make the point that a lot of people think of this as um, database stuff. Transactions are that thing that database does that's really hard. Um, but the really, they're, they're not about data, they're about programmer productivity. So what really is going on is the database system is going to provide a, an API to the application programmer who might be writing in, say, Ruby on Rails or something like that, or D3. And we're going to try to make sure that we, the folks who implemented the database, provide an API where they don't have to worry about all the hard stuff. We're going to take care of it for them in a generic layer, a library almost, you can think of, a library for concurrency control. So they can pretend they have the computer all to themselves and write programs as if they had computer all to themselves. Uh, and we'll take care of that for them. They can pretend that the, the database is always up, and uh, if it goes down, they won't lose anything. We'll take care of that for them. The alternative to this is that every programmer worries about this, and every programmer does it a little bit differently, and you know, some percentage of them, which probably would be very high, get it wrong. Right? So we're going to implement it once because it's really hard. We're going to get it right. We're awesome, and we will provide it to the programmer. And this is the, the philosophy for a long time. This philosophy is very much under debate right now. I just want to make this clear before we get into this whole set of lectures. The whole NoSQL movement is actually no transactions. It has nothing to do with SQL at all. It's just a stupid name. But it's really the no acid movement. It's the no transactions movement. And the argument there was awesome programmers at places like Amazon and Facebook and Google shouldn't count on Oracle for getting things right. They're going to get things right their damn selves. And you know what? Oracle is really slow and it's 25 years old, right? So there's a lot of that dialogue going on back and forth. And of course... People who come out and say those things sometimes get 
their you know, f fingers burned because they, they think they're going to do something. It turns out to be pretty hard to maintain and build. And sometimes they're right, actually. The Oracle is really old, and it is, in fact, better to have Google engineers building Google's infrastructure than Oracle and so on. But the philosophy, just for now, just to keep things simple, is we'll assume that most programmers, and this is still true everywhere outside of Silicon Valley, pretty much, most programmers can't write correct concurrent code. So we're going to make it really easy for them at the database layer. All right? That's going to be our goal for the next five lectures or so. And I just want you to know lots of people question that goal when they're surrounded by other awesome programmers at a place like Google. But for most of the world, this is a pretty useful goal. Okay? All right. Remember, there's our, our, our single user stack. And then horizontally here, concurrency control and recovery is going to affect our file and access methods. It's going to affect our buffer management. It's going to affect our disk space management. Meant. Those are the layers where concurrency control and recovery are going to be plugged in. And there's going to be new modules plugged in, like a transaction manager, a lock manager, a recovery manager, okay, that will add to our architecture diagram over time. All right. What is a transaction? And what do I mean by concurrency? So let's take a little bit of time here to get some definitions. This may actually take a while, all right, because we're going to want to formalize these definitions carefully. So this is going to be one of these cases where we, we say what we mean, and then we figure out how to implement it. Because until you know what you want to get, trying to implement it makes you very confused. As a historical note, if you go back into uh, the early, early work on transactions, pre-transactions, it's really confusing, and it all seems really smart. Like, they were thinking really hard about some really hard stuff, but they didn't have the right abstraction to get started. And the biggest contribution, I would say, of the research on transactions was to define the problem really carefully. Then you could go off and build lots of mechanism to solve it. But we're going to spend some time carefully defining what, what we want to achieve. Lots of people are accessing the database. What's okay and what's not okay? All right, and that's what transactions are going to help us define. So a transaction, or in the slides we may shorten it to a X act, is the database's abstract view of a user program. So the database layer doesn't want to know very much about your application semantics because if I'm selling SQL Server to the masses, I can't think about all the applications being built on top of it. There's too many of them. So I'm going to have a, a very narrow API for my database that's going to service lots and lots of different kinds of applications and make them all correct. Right? So that's what I'm, one of my goals. So all I'm going to be able to think about from the application level, all I want to know from the application is the sequence of reads and writes it makes to the database. That's my API. I don't care what you're going to do with that data, and I won't make any assumptions, or I'll make the most conservative assumptions. Maybe if you read a value somewhere at some time, it affects everything else you do, maybe. So I'm going to make that assumption. Maybe that's the most conservative assumption I can make. Anything you read from the database might affect all your future rights, for example. All right. And then the other thing we're going to do, in addition to only having an API of reads and writes, is we'll have an API of begin and end. A transaction has a beginning before you do all those reads and writes. And then it has an end. And at the end, you will tell the database to either commit the transaction. All this stuff I did up to now, I mean it. Or you will abort the transaction, or as they say in SQL, roll it back. That says, all the stuff I did since begin, make that untrue. Make that not happen. I'm sorry. I apologize. But make it go away. So every transaction has a begin and then either a commit or abort at the end. And all the work between begin and commit, if you're going to commit, should show up in the database atomically as if it happened all instantaneously at once. Okay? So that's going to be the abstract view of a program. The user does a whole bunch of reads and writes and the database makes it all happen all at once at the commit point. The transaction manager, that piece of the database system, controls the execution of transactions. The database system has no notion of what the user's program logic is. It sees only reads and writes. And so the challenge is to provide these atomic actions to perhaps concurrent users, lots of them at the same time, given only those read and write strings. Okay. Now, if you're smart, and you are, especially if you've been sitting in a lecture hall for like an hour and something, and somebody's trying to teach you something, you should ask the question, why are you teaching me this? Do I really need to know this? Maybe I can just ignore this. Why do we need to even have concurrent access to a database? Can't people just use the database one at a time and leave me alone? Like, wh what is this concurrency thing? Give me a break. By the way, a bunch of my research over the last few years starts with questions like this. I read this paper. It's really hard. I don't want to learn it. Do I have to learn it? Why is this important? And it turned out, like, for the research I was doing in the Bloom Project, no one had ever really 
said exactly why that work was important. So sometimes these are great questions to ask because they lead you to very fundamental why questions. And in fact, this question was re-asked in the last five years. Maybe we shouldn't have concurrency. And there's been a set of database systems implemented recently that aren't concurrent. I'll just put that out there. But for the moment, again, let's do the canonical argument. Why might concurrency be important? There's a latency piece to this. Does anybody have a sense of like why for user feedback time, right? Latency, the time between when I say begin transaction and the time I commit, why would concurrency be important for my latency? Yeah. Absolutely. So think about going to the grocery store when there's only one checkout line. Your personal wait time is longer than if there's more than one checkout line, probably, right? So your latency would be improved if there were more checkout lines, yeah? Your latency is improved with higher concurrency. Okay, so that's an end user kind of individual uh, desire to have low latency. What about system throughput? I don't care about you individually. I care about that my system processes a million transactions per second. Why might concurrency be good for throughput? This one's harder. Why is it good for a computer to do more than one thing at a time from the computer's perspective? Yeah. Uh, because it would be uh, efficient callbacks and multiple things creating multiple databases. Ooh, interesting. I like the second half of that a lot. Multiple things could be computing on the same database at once. And so the database stops being a bottleneck where it would have been a bottleneck. I guess you're implying if only one thing was computing on the database at once. So let's roll back to 1970, okay? Because nowadays it's, everything's more complicated. but. This stuff mattered even in simple settings. Here's the database, and as you astutely pointed out, it provides computational function, right? You push queries down there and it does things for you. Cool. So um, people queue up to do things. Here's four people waiting to get into the database. One guy's in the database right now. What would be the benefit of putting a second guy in the database? Maybe Mr. Square wants to also run. Can the database actually do more than if it does two things at once, is that faster than doing circle first, finishing it, than doing square second? And maybe it would make circle go way faster if you just did it all by itself. Think about your laptop. Is it better to run two really big jobs on your laptop at the same time, or is it better to do them one at a time in terms of getting them both done? Depends, kind of. Yeah. Awesome. So now we're starting, and this is taking your idea and breaking it down. We're starting to say, it's not just a database, man. It's got pieces, all right? So it's got an I.O. layer down here. And it's got a CPU here that does thinky stuff. And while the I.O. layer is going, the CPU could be doing something else. So in fact, maybe Mr. Circle is doing an I.O. and Mr. Square is in the CPU. And that will, in fact, go faster than doing them one at a time. Because Mr. Circle can't use the CPU and the disk at the same time, maybe. Particularly if Mr. Circle is a simple lookup. If Mr. Circle is a giant parallel query, then it can probably use all the disks and all the CPUs all at once using parallelism the way we've described. But if Mr. Circle is like, I would like to know the content of my bank account, please, that I.O., it's got nothing else to do but wait until it comes back. And it would be nice to run Mr. Square at the same time. So the key to this, wrapping up, is that a computer is a parallel machine, at least at the layer that the I.O. devices and the CPU can run in parallel. And because it's parallel, you want to schedule as many tasks as there are functional units in the computer, particularly when one of those functional units is way slower than another. In the space of an I.O., you can do millions of instructions, and you really should. All right? So your throughput goes way up if you do concurrency in a system that has disk drives on it, as long as you're not contending for those disk drives, okay, which is a different story. Both of these are critical arguments for concurrency. You don't want people to have to wait in line behind everybody else, and you want the system to use all its resources to the maximum capacity to maximize throughput. Okay, so concurrency drives both of those things. And most systems are implemented to achieve both of those things. All right, so I promised you acid, and so here it is. I want to make a really uh, key point before we go on. So people talk about ACID transactions like it's religion, okay? You come to Berkeley, you take the database class, you learn about ACID transactions. And the assumption is that ACID is like a theorem or something. 
It's not, it's like a, it's like a joke, actually. So the C was only added to make it spell acid. Originally, it was just A-I-N-D. And they're like, dude, we need to get a C in this. Let's, <laughs> let's do consistency. So um, don't try too hard to decide that acid, these four things, are like some axiom system. And each one of them is a little bit different than the others. And you can explain the real difference between atomicity and isolation is. Those are not meaningful conversations, right? We're going to get to theory in a little bit. This is not it. This is just a kind of frame of mind reference, all right? A really powerful one that's made a lot of people understand this stuff. So it, it speaks well. It, it's, uh, it's intuitive. But it's not math, okay? All right. A for atomicity. All the transactions happen or none of them happen. That's a guarantee we want to have in a transaction. All or nothing. C for consistency. If the database starts in some state that you call consistent, at the end of the transaction, it has to leave the database in a state called, that you call consistent. Your definition of consistency, you can define uh, in an application-specific way that we'll talk about in a minute. Isolation. This one is one where it's like a little squishy. The execution of your transaction is isolated from that of other transactions. What does that mean? Well, think of it as a programmer guarantee. If you're writing a program, you don't have to think about what other programs might be running. Okay, so your code doesn't have to reason about, oh my god, what would happen if somebody else jumped in and did something while my program was running? So it's a programmer API guarantee. Isolation, okay? And then finally, durability. If a transaction commits, if the database says, yes, I got it, commit, you bet, then the application can trust that the database will persist the effects of that application, of that transaction. Okay. So let's take them two at a time because they kind of pair up. Atomicity and durability are the ones that we're going to focus on uh, first. Uh, now, actually, we're actually going to focus, holy moly, we're going to focus on the other two for the next lecture, but let's go through them a little bit at a time. Atomicity and durability. A transaction ends in one of two ways, okay? It either commits or it aborts. If it commits, that's a contract from the database system. Remember, this is a library layer for programmers. So your promise as a, the implementer of this library layer called database, is that if you return from a commit call, someone says commit and you say, I return the stack from that commit call. If you return without an error message, you promise to that application that all their stuff is durable. All right? And with an abort, um, uh, you promise that none of their uh, updates happened. Aborts can happen for two reasons. One, because the user asks for them. The user might say, oh, I, this is crazy, I abort. Uh, the other is that the transaction just might not commit. Like the system might crash, and then the user goes away, or their program goes away. And when it comes back up, all the updates that transaction had made so far are invalid, and they should be aborted. Right? So aborts can just happen through circumstance. In fact, the database has the latitude to just abort stuff. And in very uh, unusual cases, it will. It'll say, oh, man, this transaction is going to be a problem. I'm aborting it. Okay, that's okay from an acid perspective. It's not real great for availability, but it's okay from an acid perspective. All right, so aborts could happen because uh, the database decides. All right, so atomicity and durability say all. That's the durability case. And it's not only that all your effects happen, but they all happen and are remembered over time. Or atomicity uh, could also mean none of your effects happen. And how is this implemented? Typically, in a uh, traditional database system, this is implemented via a log of your actions. So everything that your transaction does, which means all the reads and writes, will get written down in a sequential file called the log. We'll remember every read request, every write request, particularly the write requests, maybe not the read requests. We'll remember all your write requests, though. And then if we get to a stage where we have to abort your transaction, we'll have all your write requests, and we'll be able to undo them because we wrote them down. Used to be a four, now it's a seven. Oh, no, it's four again. So we'll be able to undo things. Or if we said we would commit, but we didn't actually commit the stuff into the database for real yet, under the covers, we still have the log. And the log, when we wake back up, will say, hey, you know, you never finished that thing you promised to commit. And then you'll redo those actions. Those things in the log that you said you were going to do in the database, you'll redo them. So the database is going to ensure atomicity and durability through a logging scheme. So both of those features, A and D, come from logging. C is the thing that got added that's extra, right? So C is kind of a goofy thing. But consistency, what is consistency? It's the integrity constraints in your SQL, let's say. It's some application-specific definition of what a good state of the database is. In the world of SQL, those are integrity constraints. All right, so your keys and foreign keys are respected. Your data types are respected, and so on. 
And all that C says is that if the database starts out and the integrity constraints are all true, at the end of transaction, they will be all true again. How does it enforce that? Well, when you say commit, it checks all the integrity constraints. And if you broke them, it aborts your transaction. Right? If you try to um, delete uh, you know, something that other people have integrity constraints and point to, then you can't delete that thing and the database will just abort you. Okay? So um, there's nothing really exciting about that. It's just a check at end of transaction that the database does to check your constraints and abort you if you broke them. Okay, so there's nothing really about, tra about the transaction layer interesting for C. But I, which is the topic that we're going to spend a lot of time on next Tuesday, is the concurrency bit, isolation. And this is going to be implemented via concurrency control. All right, so this, is, this one is quite interesting. A and D go together, that's logging. C is just this constraint enforcement at commit. I is the concurrency control part. So the database is interleaving the actions of many transactions. What are actions? They're reads and writes. That's all we're going to understand. And the database has to ensure that these, inter these transactions don't interfere with each other in some sense. We're going to have to define what that means. But we're going to give the illusion to the programmer that each transaction executes as if it ran all by itself with no other concurrent transactions. It's as if you had the whole computer to yourself, which is a very 1960s concept, right? I went down to the mainframe and I put in my deck of cards and I slid the card deck reader in and then it read them and ran my program. Computers haven't worked this way since like the early 70s. So this is an illusion. It's a programmer interface illusion. It's having a computer all to yourself is insane. It's a huge waste of resources. Nobody does that. But we're going to give the programmer the illusion that they have that and we're actually going to be able to pull this off. It's crazy how, how this works and it works pretty well. It's kind of br breaking around the edges on the, in the cloud. But it's worked for like 50 years to pretend we all had a mainframe and a deck of cards. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. You're going to get to think that you have the computer all to yourself um, and that your whole job is going to run from start to finish with no one else using this computer. So concurrent tr accesses have to have no effect on other transactions' behaviors. The net effect, and this is where things are going to get closer to definitional. This is important now. What we want is that no matter what goes on under the covers in our database system with all the wonderful high-performance stuff that we do under the covers, for the outcomes of what we do, it should be identical to some serial order of the transactions. If we really did let people have the computer one at a time, we would have queued them up in some order and run them one at a time, and that would have been okay. So we want the effects of all this stuff to be like that. I want the outcome of every program to be as if you had the computer all to yourself somewhere in this sequential serial order of all the uh, people making requests. And if we could pull that off, then users and programmers would think about their transaction in isolation without considering concurrency. So today, really meaning next time, all right, so this is a, a composite of a couple, three lectures, we're going to focus on isolation. Right? And we're going to save atomicity and durability, which is the logging and recovery piece. We'll save that till after we're done with concurrency control. These are big topics. You've got to take them one at a time. All right, so just to give you a teaser for next time. You might just run things one at a time. We said that would probably be slow. So instead, what we want to do is we want to let these things actually interleave. Your IOs happen, then my IOs happen, then your IOs happen again, then mine. I want to interleave them. But I want that interleaving of writes and reads to be equivalent in some sense to what would have happened if I went first and then completely finished and then you went. Or you went first and completely finished and then I went. I don't care which of those two things you're equivalent to, but pick one, okay? Make me equivalent to one of those two. So we need a touchstone. We need a concept for what's correctness, and that touchstone is going to be a serial schedule. So now we'll give you a little taste, and we'll finish it off next time of what we're going to define. What is a serial schedule? It's a schedule, It's that is to say, a trace of reads and writes into the database, where each transaction does all its reads and writes from start to finish without any intervening reads and writes from any other transaction. So if you looked at a trace of the system, and we're going to use a notation like this throughout the lectures, <laughs> where you're going to have a trace in time of reads and writes, and we're going to label them with the transaction's ID. So if transaction 1 does a read of a variable x, and then it does a write of a variable y, and then it does a read of a variable z, and then it commits, and then transaction two, sorry, commit one, and then transaction two does a read of variable x, et cetera. This looks to me like a serial schedule. One did all of its stuff before anyone else intervened. 
a different schedule where that read x of 2 was here, that would be a not a serial schedule. <laughs> okay? So a serial schedule is one in which you have a contiguous set of reads and writes from a single transaction followed by commit or abort, and then another contiguous set of uh, string of reads and writes. So that's, that's a correct. Any schedule that has that property we'll call serial, and serial is good, so that's nice. That's what we'll call correct. The next thing we want to be able to say is that this crazy schedule is equivalent to the serial schedule, so it's okay. I want to have schedules that are the same as serial schedules, except they're not serial. That's what I want to do, right? I want to get concurrency, but pretend that it wasn't concurrent. I want it to be the same as if it wasn't concurrent. So what does it mean for two schedules to be equivalent? Well, we're going to have to define this carefully. It's going to be, well, first of all, the two schedules have to have the same reads and writes in them, so the actual same string of accesses. And after they both run, they've got to leave the database with the same stuff in it. Do you believe that's all we care about? Nope. Can't make any assumptions. Is all we care about the state of the database at the end? Is there anything else in the world besides what's in the database? Yeah. Yeah, you might worry about like reading some stuff and then before you commit, it's reported back to the client applications. Do we care about that? Of course we care about that, right? I mean, you might say fire missile, right? And you can't undo fire missile. The, the transaction guys always like to talk about that. All right. So it is true that in our definitions, we're going to say that they're equivalent if they leave the database in the same state. But we're going to be very conservative about what assumptions we make. In particular, if you write something, we'll assume it depends on everything you read in the past. Okay. So if you write a value in the database, we don't know how you computed that value, but it might have depended on everything else you read. So if you read something in flight from some other guy, it may have colored your thinking and changed your future rights, and we don't know. So we'll capture quite a lot of what could have gone wrong by being conservative about that. Okay? Um, and we may want to come back to this topic later on as well. Um, in sometimes in the proofs you do for these things, you can always have a variable called the world, and you can always have every transaction write it at the end. And that kind of captures output. Right? So there's various sort of syntactic tricks you can play to make outside effects fit into this framework. All right. And then finally, definitionally, we have a notion that what's good is a serial schedule. We have a definition of equivalence between two schedules. And so now we can define the schedules we like. The schedules we like are the serializable schedules, meaning the schedules that are equivalent to some serial schedule. So you can run any interleaving of reads and writes you like as long as it's equivalent to some serial schedule. We don't care who gets to go first and who gets to go second. We just care that it's as if somebody went first and somebody went second. Okay? And if you can interleave stuff along the way, but the net effect is the same as if one of them went first and the other went second, that's cool. That's a serializable schedule. Question? Uh, is that any serial schedule or any serial schedule? Any serial schedule. So in particular, this is not a very good semantics if what you're interested in is like high frequency trading. All right? People don't use traditional transactions for high frequency trading because it matters a great deal who went first and who went second. Right? Um, but by contrast, if all we're worried about is like that we're making sure that if we charged your credit card, we will ship you the item, somebody might not be able to get the item because we ran out, but that's fine. It's like it's going to be Bob or it's going to be Mary. We don't really care. We're Amazon, right? We just want to make sure that if we build you for it, you get the item. Okay, lots and lots of things. It doesn't matter what the order is. It just matters that there is an order, right, that's meaningful. What we certainly don't want is that we build your credit card and you got Mary's stuff or, you know, uh, we got the inventory wrong because we mixed up the, the reads and the rights. Right? We want it to be some reasonable, rational serial schedule or something equivalent to it. But we're not going to care about who comes first and who comes second. That's why it says any serial schedule. Any ordering will do. If you can find an ordering that's equivalent, then it's good. All right. So this notion of serializable schedules, to close out what we talked about before, once you define this, once you agree that this is our definition of goodness, and like I say, it's not the right definition for everything. It's not good for high-frequency training. All right. But if you believe that this is a, a good definition, now we can go make up mechanisms to achieve it. All right. 
And it took a while to get here. Like, and you may want to even quibble about this today, but boy, this brought a lot of clarity. Once they define what a serializable schedule is, then everything can kind of flow. So there's a bunch of theory that what are the schedules that are serializable, what are their properties, and then a bunch of practice about how do you make this stuff go fast? How do you implement a system that achieves serializable schedules only? And so that's what we'll talk about when we return next week. See you.